Okay, we're now going to spend the whole class on the rapture and the resurrection. And there's a lot to go over, so uh, my apologies, but I might have to go pretty quick. First and foremost, what are the major rapture theories out there? Well, the most popular is the pre-trib. Uh, that was made popular by the Left Behind series. And they believe that the rapture is imminent, that it can happen any moment now. It could happen before this tape is over. That means that there's no remaining precursors. But they believe it has to happen before the last seven years of uh, Daniel 77s because they see that as God's wrath and they believe that uh, the saints were not destined for God's wrath, which we all believe there. The question is, is the tribulation God's wrath or Satan's wrath? And then there's the mid-trib. Mid-trib, uh, they believe the rapture happens, happens pretty much right when, when the Antichrist established the abomination of desolation in the middle of the 77 in the temple. Uh, this is uh, kind of gone by the wayside uh, through the years, and so we're not even going to discuss that other than just define it. Then there's pre-wrath. Pre-wrath puts the rapture after the three and a half year midpoint of Daniel 77, when the great tribulation is cut short by Jesus to save God's elect, which we will read about in the Olivet Discourse. However, they also say four events must occur before the rapture. One, the return of Elijah the prophet, found in Malachi 4.5. Two, the great falling away of man, the great apostasy. Three, the revealing of the Antichrist. Uh, four, the cosmic event of the sun, moon, and stars going dark. Uh, that's all over the Old Testament uh, and New Testament. Um, they believe that the saints will be raptured into heaven and they'll spend time with Jesus Christ before God's wrath is poured out on the earth, uh, especially in the Battle of Armageddon. And this was the most common position of the early church. So most of the early church writings uh, focused on pre-wrath. And then uh, kind of a newcomer is post-trib or post-tribulation. Uh, the post-trib crowd believes that the church, the saints, all, all uh, mean the same thing, will go through the full seven years of Daniel's 70, uh, seven, 70th 7th, but they are protected, and that is where the Goshen principle comes in from Exodus, rather than being raptured out from God's, uh, from God's wrath. The rapture saints, the difference between the pre-wrath and the post-trib is that the post-trib believe that the saints will just meet the Lord in the air, uh, as in Thessalonians. And then from there, uh, they just follow him into, uh, into battle. Uh, and, uh, of course, they will be with Christ um, forever and ever. So, having said all that, we're going to start with um, pre-trib crowd. And the best example that I thought I could find would be somebody, a theologian that I really admire a lot, um, John MacArthur. I got tons of his books. And uh, the church that he pastors, which is Grace Community Church, this is their statement of belief in verbatim, quoted, the rapture of the church. And they teach, we teach the personal bodily return of our Lord Jesus Christ before the seven-year tribulation. Uh, and then they give uh, two scriptures to translate his church from this earth. They give three scriptures. And between this event and his glorious return with his saints to reward believers according to their works. And with that, he gives uh, two scriptures as well. So, we will definitely dissect this. First and foremost, their first uh, statement is we teach the personal bodily return of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is coming personally uh, uh, before the seven-year tribulation 
and that is to, uh, to rapture the saints. So the biggest and most significant difference between the pre-trib rapture theory and all the others is that the pre-trib believes that the great tribulation is God's wrath. The others believe, no, it's not God's wrath. This is God releasing Satan, and it's Satan's wrath uh, being exercised on uh, Israel and the saints. And so, therefore, they believe the church is raptured out before the tribulation starts. So, let's look at these scriptures. Okay, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Yes, of course. With a loud command with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So does this tell us that Christ is coming before the seven-year tribulation? No. Let's look at the second verse, Titus 2.13. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, we're all waiting for the second coming of Jesus. Um... But does this first tell us that he is going to come before the seven-year tribulation? And the answer is once again, no. It, it does not even, neither scripture addresses this in any form or fashion. Okay, but let's read on. What's, what's the remainder of the teaching? We teach, okay, the personal body return of our Lord Jesus Christ before the seven-year tribulation to translate his church from this earth. And with that, he gives John 14, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, and 1 Thessalonians 4. Okay, let's look at those passages. So what we're looking at is to translate his church from this earth. John 14, 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believes also in me. My father's house has many rooms, and if that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. Okay, and that's what they're saying is the rapture. That you also may be where I am. So translate his church from this earth? Yes, that supports it. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. So yes, at the sound of the last trumpet, the dead will be raised, and we will be changed. Is that uh, Jesus Christ translating his church from this earth? Yes. Okay, let's look also at the first Thessalonians, so, which is a long passage, so uh, bear with me. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep or have died before us. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead of Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left up, uh, and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Does this uh, support translating his church from this earth? Yes. I'll go ahead and read the rest just to be thorough. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness, so then let us not be like the others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate. 
and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us, his church, to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Uh, and this is translating his church uh, from this earth once again. And so, um, therefore, encourage one another, build each other up, just as the fact that you're doing. So, yes, the scripture solidly supports that Jesus will translate his church from this earth. And then we read on. And between this event, this event would be the rapture and the resurrection, and so that will be a separate coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and his glorious return. So there's another return. So there's a third coming, uh, the remainder of uh, what we call the parousia uh, with his saints to reward believers according to their works. And there he gives uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15 and 2 Corinthians 5, 10. So let's look at those scriptures. So what we're looking for here is that between this event, the rapture, and his glorious return, a third coming, uh, he will be coming with his saints the third time to reward believers according to their works. Okay. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold or silver or costly stones, wood or hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day, now the day, that will be the day, I guess, of, of, of a judgment here, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives... The builder will receive a reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. So this passage here basically tells us that there will be a day of, of judgment and rewards, and that will be tested, uh, in, in Paul's words, with fire. And what burns up will not be... Uh, well, it definitely will not be rewarded. Um, and if there's almost nothing left, um, the saint will suffer loss, yet will be saved. But even though only it's one escaping through the flames. So it's not, um, uh, no accomplishments to be rewarded, but he will be saved by the blood of the Lamb. Um, and 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So both of these verses, yeah, they, they uh, are dealing with uh, judgment and rewards. Uh, doesn't necessarily uh, give any definition in, uh, on a timeline between this event and his glorious return. But uh, to be honest, um, that's a very, very uh, minor detail here. Um, so with that, uh, we'll say, yeah, they, they kind of supports it and move on. So here's my takeaway on this. First and foremost, there is no scriptural basis for a rapture to escape the Antichrist Great Tribulation. Case closed. Scripture tells us quite the opposite. Jesus, in fact, teaches the opposite where he says, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, well, when you see, it means just that. When you see it, when does that happen? In the middle of the tribulation, or the middle of the, of the 77th, which starts the great tribulation. So uh, the pre-rapture, the pre-tribulation rapture, uh, really, it gives a false impression that there's no need for the saints to prepare. Uh, because don't worry, Bad times are going to come. Great tribulation that you've never uh, experienced before in your life. But don't worry, you're going to be raptured out. Uh, we're all going to be up in heaven. I don't know, sitting in top hot tubs and uh, uh, eating popcorn, watching all this going, down, going on down below. And that is a very, very dangerous um, teaching. Because if what I see in Scripture and what I see in, in Jesus' teachings and 
Paul's teaching and John's teaching and Daniel's teaching is that the saints will go through the tribulation as orchestrated and ordained by God and then they find out that, oh, we're not going to be yanked away. But I've heard this for years and years and years across the pulpit and all the classes I, t I teach. That's pulling the rug out from under what they fundamentally believe in. And that could be enough to persuade somebody that thinks they're a Christian to go, no, this is not true. Everything they told me is not true. And they could possibly walk away. So we, I see it as dangerous. It misidentifies the Great Tribulation as God's wrath. Um, scripture identifies the Great Tribulation as God allowing Satan, and he'll be using Satan will be using the Antichrist and the false prophet because God gives power to Satan. Satan gives power to uh, the Antichrist and the false prophet to what? Quote unquote to make war on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Those are Christians. This is Satan's wrath. Now, the pre-trib answer to this will be, no, 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 no. Uh, all the church has been raptured out. These are those that uh, came to believe in Jesus Christ after the rapture. But, uh, beloved, there's no such teaching in the Bible. Um, and note also that this great tribulation uh, that's against the Christians, it's a different from the Jacob's trouble, which we've talked about in past, which is God dealing with the remnant of surviving Jews that have yet to acknowledge Yeshua as the Messiah. And then, of course, there's a whole series of uh, Old Testament passages that teaches on that. So uh, while I have the utmost respect for your um, John MacArthur and so many of his teachings and books. Um, the pre-trib rapture theory, um, I do not see uh, any scriptural basis on it. And regrettably, this is probably the biggest version of the rapture that's coming out of seminaries today. So, let's look at what the Bible teaches. Let's go first to Daniel 12, because that's really the first mention of um, the resurrection and possibly even the rapture. Daniel 12, verse 1. At that time, okay, at that time shall rise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble. Uh, that will be the great tribulation, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. Okay, at that time shall arise Michael. We re read about that in Revelation tw uh, 12, where there's a war in heaven, and Michael and his angels are fighting against the dragon. And the dragon is what? Thrown down, and he's called the devil and Satan, in case there's any misunderstanding. And his angels were thrown down with him. And they, who's the they? That would be the Christian saints have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows his time is short. So this tells us that the saints in Daniel 12 will be on the earth at that time which will be a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation till that time. Well, did Jesus teach that? Well, this is what Jesus said in his Olivet Discourse. For then there will be great tribulation such as not been from the beginning of the world until now. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Well, for the, if for the sake of the elect, those days will cut short, that means the elect are down there experiencing the Great Tribulation. Okay? Uh, there's really no wiggle room for misunderstanding or misinterpreting this. Okay, let's read on. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Oh, they will be rescued. Now, what does the Hebrew word for deliver mean? here. It's melat, and it means to deliver, to escape, 
to rescue or to save. So this could very likely be the rapture, or it could also be part of the Goshen effect. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. So God will be taking care of the saints. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. That is the resurrection. Okay? And what's at that time? That is after the time of trouble, such as never been since the, there was a nation till that time. Uh, and then, uh, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book, just adds another qualifier to who your people are, the elect. And many of those who sleep in the dust shall awake. That is the resurrection. Some to everlasting life. That will be the first resurrection. Some to shame and everlasting contempt. That will be the second resurrection uh, with the great white throne judgment. Um, and the casting of the non-believers to the lake of fire. And those who are wise... The mescaline shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. What are we saying here? I'm not sure, but it, is it the rapture? Who knows? Maybe. And those who turn many to righteousness like stars forever and ever. So a very, very interesting and revealing passage by the prophet Daniel. Now what did Jesus teach? Because uh, at the end of the day... If Jesus' teaching uh, conflicts with any of these other interpretations, then um, those interpretations are null and void. So, what did Jesus teach? Before we get into that, we'll just quickly review the word parousia. And that is usually, we see translated as a verb, the word coming. Uh, but in actuality, it's a noun. And it means an arrival and a continuing presence. There's a lot going on in the parousia. Um, it's the Greek word behind the second coming, but it's so much more. Uh, first and foremost, in the New Testament, it's always, when associated with Jesus' coming, it's used as a singular uh, uh, noun, never plural. So there's only one, parousia. But there's a lot of things in it. It's Jesus' arrival in the clouds. It's his resurrection the resurrection of the dead. It's the rapture of those who are still alive on his arrival. It's the day of the Lord's wrath. But even that is a very interesting phrase. Because in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord's wrath, well, which you look at the word day, which is yom, that can mean a 24-hour day. It can mean daytime. Or it can also mean an indefinite period of time. So the day of the Lord's wrath, we cannot assume that that is a 24-hour period. It is yom, uh, which can be an indefinite period of time. It's bringing the remnant of Israel to salvation. It's establishing his earthly rule. It's judgment and rewards. It's the wedding and the wedding feast. So there's so much behind this. Now, when we get to the Olivet Discourse, what uh, Jesus' disciples came and asked, Three specific questions. Tell us, Lord Jesus, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? Your coming is the parousia. And what will be the sign of the end of the age? Very, very important questions. And it sets the whole context of the Olivet Discourse. And then we get down to uh, verse 9 where Jesus says, Then... And he's already explained there's going to be false Christ, there's going to be nation rising against nation, but nation here is the Greek word ethnos, so it's ethnic group rising against ethnic group, uh, kingdom against kingdom. Uh, now that would be more uh, political states against political states or countries, famines and earthquakes. And then he says they, and who are the they? They are the Antichrist, his army, his followers. They will deliver you Who's the you? Is it, is it Christians? Is it Jews? It's Christians. And we'll explain in a second. Up to the tribulation. So they will deliver you up to the tribulation and they will put you to death. There's going to be martyrdom. And you will be hated by all nations. Why? For my name's sake. So that tells us this is against levied against Christians. The church, not Orthodox 
uh, Jews, uh, unless, uh, well, the only Jews that would be addressed would be the millennial Jews that believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. So in all this tribulation, then people's faith are going to get tested and, and the church is going to find out who are really the true Christian believers and who are there uh, for other reasons other than the Lord Jesus Christ. That will be the great apostasy, the falling away. And many prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will, go, will grow cold. And of course, there's a, we've had a whole teaching on that. But the one who endures to the end. This is so critically important. The one who endures to the end will be saved. That, so it's evident that Jesus' message here is preparation. You need to prepare to endure the tribulation. There's no teaching here that they're going to be rescued out uh, and of an early rapture. Otherwise, they'll say, don't worry about it uh, because you will be raptured. No. The one who endures to the end will be saved. The word here is, is sozo, which means to save, but it also means to rescue, to preserve safe and unharmed. So the rescue, that could be like the rapture. To preserve safe and unharmed, that could be like the Goshen principle. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. And he goes on, he says, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, that's the middle of the 77th, uh, standing in the holy place, so three and a half years into the last seven, in the holy place, in the third temple, let the reader understand. What that means is that the reader will understand. He will not be surprised, or she will not be surprised or caught unaware of what's happening, because they have studied scripture, they've studied prophecy, and they know and understand what to expect, and they're preparing their minds, their hearts, uh, their souls uh, to, to A, to endure, but B, to also uh, evangelize. This will be the church's most finest hour of leading those that are in meltdown mode but are seeking the truth to Christ. And then he goes on, then, then, when you see the abomination of desolation, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Uh, that is uh, not only the great tribulation, but Jacob's trouble. For then, for then there will be great tribulation for the Christians and the non-Messianic Jews, um, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. So that would be the rapture. But for the sake of the elect, meaning the saints will be on earth during all this, those days will be cut short. And then he goes on. He says, immediately after the tribulation, so now we're talking either post-trib or pre-wrath, of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give his light, the stars will fall from heaven. This is all happens in Revelation 6 and the sixth seal and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. That's also part of the sixth seal and the fourth trumpet. Then, what happens? Will appear in heaven, the sign of the Son of Man. And then, all the tribes on the earth will mourn. Or maybe a better translation would be, all the tribes... Uh, of the of the territory, like Israel, will will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming. Once again, that word parousia, on the clouds, the cloud rider of heaven with power and great glory. And verse thirty one, he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. First um, Corinthians calls it the last trumpet, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from the one end of the heaven until the other. That, beloved, is the resurrection and the rapture. And with verse 31 being the resurrection, that means verse 31 is after verse 29, which is the great tribulation. That means verse 31 is after verse 30, which means the, 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 uh, the coming of the Son of Man, where everybody sees on the clouds of heaven. That's 
the rapture, and the resurrection according to our Lord Jesus Christ. The Mark and Luke accounts, I got them listed here, give the same story for uh, brevity. I'm not going to go through them, but it's Mark 13, 24 uh, to 27, and Luke 21, 25 until 28. So let's move on, because Jesus has more to say about this. But concerning that day, that day, well, that's the, the, the day that everybody's always interested in. When are you coming, Lord? When are we going to be raptured out? Um, that day and hour, nobody knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the parousia, the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. And then listen to these two verses. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, raptured, and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one taken, raptured, and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day the Lord is coming, but you know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore... You also must be ready. You must be prepared. That's a, that's a huge theme of the Olivet Discourse. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So if verse 40 and 41 is the rapture, one will be taken, one left behind, then the rapture is what? It's linked with the coming of the Son of Man, the parousia. That's in the verse up above in, in verse 37. Not before the tribulation. Okay, so there's just no scriptural um, support uh, that the church, the saints, will be raptured out before the tribulation. So here are the giveaways that, as I see in the Olivet Discourse. First and foremost, Jesus' intention was to prepare his followers for going through the tribulation. Okay, this is Satan's wrath, and Satan's wrath is obviously for, uh, focus against what? Israel, the Jewish people, the Christians. It's not focused on the, on the worldly people. That's not where Satan is going to spew his wrath. So Jesus expected his believers to be well informed as to what to expect and to be wary of deception, including false messiahs. Uh, he did not teach that believers will be rescued through an early rapture. What he taught was what? the one who endures to the end will be saved. And of course, we also dissected the Greek word of saved. Um, I think it was sozo that could be um, rescued. He taught that many will fall away. That's the great apostasy. He taught that ethnic groups will rise against ethnic groups. That's nation against nation or ethnos against ethnos. Um, and a good example would be most likely Islam and Arabs um, and atheists against Jews and Christians. All of those could be considered ethnic groups. He taught that there would be massive, massive persecution against Christians. What were his words? You will be hated by all nations. Okay, once again, the word here is ethnos, by all ethnic groups, for my name's sake. So that is specifically uh, uh, given attention to my namesake, which is Christians. The church, what's the church to do in all this? The church is expected to witness uh, what's going on. The abomination of desolation, which is the midpoint of Daniel 77th, the great tribulation, and therefore Christians will see the Antichrist. But the church is also to, to stand firm and to be a testimony uh, which we will get to later. So the resurrection and rapture, is it will occur when the Son of Man comes on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And this happens after the tribulation and after the cosmic event of the sun, moon, and stars going dark. So now we've looked at Jesus teaching. What did the Apostle Paul teach? Good question. Let's look at it. 
First and foremost, I think it's important to put Paul in context because, you know, everybody is focused on Revelation and the Apostle John that was taken up into the third heaven, into the heavenly courts, and saw things that was just indescribable, even though he was tasked with putting them in words. Well, guess what happened to Paul? He was also taken into the third heaven. Uh, and uh, so he also has a first-hand perspective, just like the Apostle John. So we really need to pay attention to Paul. Uh, the, the supporting verse is 2 Corinthians 12. Where Paul says, I must go on boasting, even though there's nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man. Oh, that man was me, by the way, in Christ, who 14 years ago was caught up into the third heaven. Whether in body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I, Paul, will boast. But on my behalf, I will not boast except of my weakness. So Paul was uh, seeing things and given revelations a lot that he was not allowed to disclose. But here's what he has disclosed. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable. And then we, we would be those that are still alive. That would be the rapture. We shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. And when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortality puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? So we'll dissect this a little bit. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. Unredeemed bodies that are not glorified, that, um, that still have sin in them, cannot enter the kingdom of God. And this was explained in a few verses prior to this, in verse 42, where Paul says, So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown or buried in dishonored. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural decaying body. It is raised a spiritual body. And if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So very important teaching there. But he goes on and says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Uh, Not everybody is going to be resurrected. Why? Because some of us will still be alive and be raptured instead. But we will all be changed. Uh, Everybody that is entering into God's kingdom will be given a sinless, imperishable glorified body. How's this going to happen? Well, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, very important, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be trained, changed. Now, the sounding of the last trumpet, if we put that in the context of Revelation, when does that happen? The seventh trumpet found in Revelation 10, 7, and further expanded on in chapter 11, verse 15. Paul goes on to say, For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality, so the dead in Christ, very important, will be resurrected, and we, the living in Christ, shall also take on imperishable bodies. And then when the imperishable puts on the uh, the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that's written: Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? 
I gave you two passages here, uh, Hosea 13, 14, and Isaiah 25, verse 8, that uh, uh, shows these prophecies being fulfilled. Okay, let's read in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1, another very important passage from the Apostle Paul. Now concerning the coming, that's what, the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ, and and not only his coming, but our being gathered together with him. So that would be the resurrection and the rapture. For that day will not come. And this is some very, very specific qualifications. Unless one, the rebellion comes first. Unless two, the man of lawlessness is revealed. The son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of work, worship. So uh, that is um, uh, the Antichrist. And three, the, he, the, the Antichrist, takes a seat at the temple of God. That's the abomination of desolation. And four, proclaiming himself to be God. And these specific events outlined by Paul are in full agreement with what Jesus teaches in the Olivet Discourse. So let's move on to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. Where Paul says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and oh, with the sound of the trumpet. There's the trumpet again of God. And what? The dead in Christ will rise first. That's the resurrection. And then we who are alive, what? Who are left will be caught up together, raptured, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Very, very powerful teaching here. So Jesus himself will physically leave the throne room, descend to earth, and that's important because is he in the throne room or not? There are some of these passages we have to answer that question, and descend to earth to gather, so that's the resurrection and rapture his people. Uh, this will happen with the sounding of the last trumpet. Uh, which we just read in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. The last trumpet sounded in Revelation is what? The seventh trumpet. Uh, the seventh trumpet is also not a one-day event, because listen to this in Revelation 10, 7. But that in the days, plural, of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Um, and then verse uh, 17 in Thessalonians here, we'll be caught together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Um, and so we will always be with the Lord. So after meeting Jesus in the clouds, what happens immediately next, Paul does not really go into that detail. So Paul does not confirm what happens next. Is it a pre-wrath or post-trib type scenario? Uh, uh, are they going uh, straight into the charge of Armageddon or are the saints going to be returned uh, with Jesus to the throne room uh, which we'll read about in Revelation 7 um, also if we apply the biblical pattern on what happened in Exodus because Exodus is so important and it's a type and a foreshadow of what to expect uh, uh, in end time events so if we put this biblical pattern of what happened in Exodus to the end time events in Revelation, then what can we conclude? That God will personally remove his people before he pours out his full wrath. That just as God parted the Red Sea to allow Moses and the children of Israel to what? To escape, to pass through. So will he part the heavens the, where we see the sky vanishing like a scroll be rolled up um, in Revelation 6, and call the church to him. And when the church has been raptured, the Lord will what? Close the heavens just like he closed the Red Sea, and then he will pour out his wrath on unrepentant mankind. And we will get much more in detail in this lesson on the Passover uh, pattern. So, uh, that's going to stop part one, and we'll take up part two video with uh, what we see in the book of Revelation itself.